I'm thinking Bond. Bond. I am I now beginning to think. Bond. I am thinking Bond. Love Could you imagine Bond. if you were doing Bond and then all of a sudden you said, Jordan, I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> what? Come on, Cal. Why don't you go? We'll we'll start a campaign on this podcast. I'll do Bond. Cal, <laughs> Cal Penn for Bond. What I'm do you think? Down. I'm super down. I would I would do it. I mean, it's kind of a misogynistic character. I don't know if you want to be regressive. I mean, the first Indian Bond, yikes, who's misogynistic. Way to go, Cal. A terrorist and now a misogynist. You're, you're, you represent an entire culture, sir. A shame on you. First of all, you keep talking about being rich. Now, are you really rich, or is this like? I mean, I, I mean, what what gives here with this rich well, stuff? I mean, I, I'm definitely Ohio rich, which means uh, high school diploma. So that is fine. That's uh, easily Ohio rich. Uh, but I, like I've said before, the people who are most rich talk about being rich, like my myself. So yes, I think put me in the, the rich category. You know what I found, Jordan? Now this is I'm going to make somebody really angry about this. There's one thing about super rich people. So I was talking to this super rich guy, billionaire guy, you know, and I'm asking him, he's telling me about his business. Then I ask him about his family. He goes through every one of his kids, which was delightful. He's telling me about his wife and all this stuff. And after about 45 minutes, he said, well, I have to go now. And he didn't ask one single thing about my family, my kids. That's really disappointing. And so I've, I've been thinking about that lately. I mean, there are super rich people who are not into themselves, but they're super rich people who I think they defy gravity. Like, you know, they're never going to die. Everything's great. And they overcome everything. You ever thought about that? Do you ever find that to be true? Well, as a super rich person, I don't often waste my time thinking about other people. So uh, <laughs> no, I haven't necessarily been there. Uh, I will share an anecdote actually that I find Interesting. In talking about the super rich, there's a great story that I love uh, that Kurt Vonnegut once told. That Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller. Uh, Are they Joseph friends he of yours? Like they, you oh, always he, say, how you look how you drop in a name. Is that because you finally read a book? Is, I, for, I forget. But I, I'm referencing deceased authors. But okay. These, these are authors. These are people of letters, Governor. They write, <laughs> they create our culture. Uh, if, if these were, I don't know, NRA donors, would you be more uh, affiliated with them? I, 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 these are these are my people. This is my clan, the uh, the writers of America. Okay. Uh, yeah, but the story goes that uh, Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch Twenty Two, is at a party with Kurt Vonnegut uh, at a billionaire's house, and they're looking around. And Kurt Vonnegut says to Joseph Heller, "He's like, does it make you mad that?" Uh, this person in this house makes more money in a day than probably what all of Catch-22 will make in your entire lifetime. And Joseph Heller goes, no, because I have one thing that he doesn't have. And Vonnegut says, what? And Heller says, I know what enough is. And I think that's very, I think that's very apt. I think the, you know, the ability it's, it's to fun, understand yeah. when you have what enough. is enough, and I think there is something that plagues call it the super rich with this idea that they will achieve the thing that makes them happy. Whereas I think the, the human challenge is to understand that you need to make happiness out of the things that you already have. And I say well, this you, having yeah. read about the experience, not having lived it again as well, a super rich you know, person, yeah. this is totally foreign to me, but I'm just grasping at straws to find well, the connection. Well, no, no. There. The guy that, that kind of manages some of my money, he said, you know, you, you, your goal should never be the richest man in the cemetery. And my friend Bob Blair and I go walking every Saturday. We go walking, you know, I don't know, seven, eight miles usually. And we went walking on Saturday. We go past the cemetery and we both look down there and we laugh. And we say, you know, with all the most important people and all the people who no one ever heard of, they all have one thing in common. <laughs> they're, they're located in, in that cemetery, which, you know, it's, it's, it, in a way it's sort of, you know, humorous, but in a way it's so darn true. And uh, so... Anyway, enough said can, about these rich people. And let me ask you one, way, can, I, yeah. can I ask you one let me ask you one serious question about yeah. the super rich. There is a yeah. larger idea right now that I've heard I can't remember who said it, but the idea that we are a broken culture when we do have a class of super rich. The fact that you have billionaires some would see as an example of a broken system. That like even capitalism shouldn't work to a point where somebody has so much money uh uh like who would need more than 
a handful of millions of dollars, more yeah. than a hundred. Like the fact that we have billionaires, that class in and of itself is is proof of a broken capitalistic system. Would you agree? No, I, I wouldn't because, I mean, what what you also find is a lot of these people who are billionaires are giving away their entire fortune. Not I mean, the entire, it, rarely like, the entire. I feel like well, they give away they give away 1% and they're seen no, as heroes. No, 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 no. People like Gates and I don't know, all those people, the Warren Buffett, I mean, they give away tremendous amounts of money. Uh, but if, if you take uh, Bezos, you know, I, I would drop another name. I happen to know a little bit about him. And, you know, he started with nothing. Now, the fact that he's made an enormous amount of money, he's changed, he's changed so much of the country uh, with what he's done at Amazon. So I don't hold it against him. But I think what you said earlier is something that Do you think that's what that Bezos I, does with his Amazon employees? He inspires them by letting them start with nothing as well? Well, you know, what's interesting about it is I went out in Seattle and I went through one of those Amazon operations. And what I couldn't believe is that you can go and get trained, at least in this one in Seattle, for any job you want. And it doesn't have to be a job that's connected to Amazon. So I know you got this thing about you don't like these billionaires or you don't think the system works, but it's where we have a kind of a point of disagreement. Cause I'm, I'm, but I don't think, but I think there's an issue of greed. And I think that's something that anybody who has something or somebody who's accumulating something, and it's something you said earlier, which is, you know, when is enough enough? And when it translates into greed, you know, then I think it gets to be a problem. And then it's interesting to ask people, you know, what's their definition of greed? But I think we all kind of know. But speaking about wanting to be rich, I was talking to our brilliant producer, Max, who has an idea about food trucks. And his idea is he wants to have a breakfast food truck, which led me to tell him about my idea. Jordan, have you ever been to Dairy Queen? You ever been to a Dairy Queen? Maybe you don't. They don't have that in New York, maybe. We're all but over the go. map here. I love okay. it. Okay, so when you I've go to, to Dairy, Dairy Queen. Queen, I grew up in Kalamazoo. There's a Dairy, Dairy Queen. I used to get blizzards every, all the on time. On every block. So let me ask you what you think of, about this idea. First of all, my wife, my daughter, and I were in Florida, and we offered, we ordered three children's size ice cream cones. You know what it costs? Nine dollars. Nine dollars for three children's ice cream cones. Okay, but that's just the, that's an aggravation. But here's the thing that I wanted to know. When you eat that Dairy Queen ice cream, right, and you get through the ice cream and you're biting through the cone and you get about one inch from the end of the cone and it's filled with ice cream and it's that cone and you put it in your mouth and you chomp it and it's like an explosion of delight, right? So I wanted to come up with a, with a company. Maybe you and I could do this together. Uh, and we would put out these things called cone bites and we would sell them just the end of the cone and we could sell like a dozen of them don't you think that might really take off cone you know what? bites it's you know all what? in the name too we'll ask cal about it you know he's, yeah. he's a smart you know guy. as i th- as cone i think bites. about it you know at first it sounds like a stupid idea but then when you really think about it you realize your initial reaction was completely correct <laughs> It's probably a bad idea. Part of what you like about what's in the cone is you put in the effort to get to the bottom of the cone. Uh, although I will, I will admit, if you could say it's what would you say? It's like an explosion of taste. Yes, right there, that last inch, that last inch. You can't have two inches. It's just that's why it's called cone bites. Cone bites. That's it. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it just really does. All cone right, we're going to lose our guest if we don't. I think don't. so. And uh, any investments. And we I make, wonder if these he may be rich ideas. too. Don't you think he could be really rich too? Because he's famous and he's done about everything. And he went, even took time off to go into government. And you know, this is really this is. I'm excited to hear what this guy has to say. This man is impressive. He's lived in both of our worlds, uh, the entertainment world, the, the governmental world. Um, and so yeah, we, well, I guess we can find out which world, if you want to be super, super rich, which is the best one to to live within. Um, <laughs> let's bring him in. He's in, incredibly prolific in all of these worlds. Uh, you may know him as the star of Harold and Kumar franchise, shows like House, Designated Survivor. Uh, but outside of Hollywood, he was an associate director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, where he was President Obama's liaison to young Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and the arts communities in America. And he's got an entertaining, and actually it's, it's a very refreshingly 
candid memoir called You Can't Be Serious. It's available now wherever you get books or if you get ebooks or audiobooks, you can get it. Uh, let's welcome to the show Cal Penn. Hey, Cal. Hey, how are you guys? Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, you've heard all these brilliant ideas. What, what, what a yeah. thoughtful podcast this is, talking about the <laughs> issues that define America today. I, I got to say, I want in on the ice cream bite. Cone uh, bites, uh, Cal. Please. You got to get them. What if, come on, what if I said, oh, I saw you were on 23? Okay. I mean, come on, cone bites. Can you put that down? Cone bites, cone yeah. bites. I, cone I'm, bites. A, I'm already a fan because you're right. That is the best part of it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and you you have to, you're, ta- you're also taking away the work, right? Because anybody who loves that last bite, you're like always pushing down with your tongue. Oh, that is so right? true. You're prepping for that. You're taking away all of the work. It's a genius idea. But isn't, well, that, what, isn't that what you enjoy? You enjoy the, the spoils of work. And that's what a cone bite is, is you have to put in the work, put in the time until you get to it. I think if you just give somebody it, then it becomes, essentially you're, you're then making ice cream at the bottom of a cone, the ice cream at the top of the cone, simply yeah. because you have to factor in the work of the equation. Yeah, but Jordan, that's like, you were talking about the billionaire thing. This is, this is perhaps the epitome of late stage capitalism is cone bites. No, <laughs> no work required. Just buy, buy the no, no efforts. Just buy the what's left and eat it, and that's it. This well, is but the, then, you know, there's another part of this, and that is once we exhaust the popularity of cone bites, then we can sell the upper part of the cone. But we'll have to come up with a name for that. Cal, would you give that some thought yeah. and let oh. us know? Because the upper part then becomes. It's really, it's, this is a fascinating and amazing thing. I don't know why I've been sitting on it for so many years. <laughs> I mean, obvious question. We don't want to spend the entire podcast on this. But if you're suddenly selling the top of a cone, you have to figure out what is the device that it's transferred in, which essentially you're going to run the numbers and it's going to be a cone. And you're just going to find yourself back at the end of like, otherwise it's just a puddle of ice cream. And who wants to buy a puddle of ice cream? That's a good point there. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go off of this world of finances, Cal, because, you know, everybody who listens to a podcast, they're trying to figure out how do I turn this into a quick buck? You have lived in both of these worlds, both of which I want to explore. But from a financial standpoint, what did you see? Did you see what, what, what how did the greed of Hollywood compare to the greed of D.C.? So I don't I think the one of the biggest jarring things, because I, I really did try to make an effort to keep those two worlds separate. I, I really it was it, uh, I was very humbled and honored to to serve at the White House. And, and it was like a, it was, I took a full sabbatical from acting for those two years. But the one thing that really shocked me was it, because it's the public sector, things take forever to get done. And part of it is because that's how a democracy works, right? It, it's why we don't have a dictatorship, that three branches of government work in specific ways. There are all these rules and regulations you have to follow so that things don't happen overnight. But by the same token, there were things that you just realized like, wow, if this human who I'm working with was in the private sector, they would have got fired like on day two. But I, I think going from like the egregious example of Hollywood, which of course is not known for its kindness, uh, to the egregious example of public service, where it's the opposite, right? Where there are a lot of people who are doing it because they want to do the right thing, or at least they think they want to do the right thing, although that's obviously changed in the last several years. Uh, I don't know. I think th- so. Rather than just the money making thing, that was the biggest, the 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 biggest kind of craziest thing that I noticed was the uh, the back and forth. Which, since you plugged my book, I will say in the audio book in the book, I do talk about that in a little more detail. <laughs> oh, you're not going to give it to us for free? This is no. Smart. I'll give it to you for free, of course. This is smart. Of course. <laughs> hey, Cal. Let me let me just jump in there a second, yeah. Jordan. I think you, maybe you'll find this interesting. I. Everybody says, I remember when I first became governor, you know, I privatized economic development. I said, we have to move at the speed of business, you know, not at the speed of bureaucracy. But I also have a business now that I run and I deal with other businesses. And I had to tell you, there's, there are businesses, they can't get out of their own way. They can't decide anything. Uh, you know, they know, they know they need to do things on, on workforce, but they just, they just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. You know, the businesses that move fast are the ones that survive. The ones that move slow die. And in government, the same thing is true. I mean, if you move too slowly, you're going to get behind a curve. You're going to get chewed up in election or you're going to get a bad reputation. So I think speed is the issue in whichever sector it is, including Hollywood for that matter. The sector that can move the fastest 
and be the most creative is the one that's going to win. And also the one that doesn't worry about a failure. You know, people worry about failing. I I feel like that's especially true of the last 10 years in Hollywood. There's, you know, there's a, um, I, I, in my book, I write a lot about diversity, but from the angle that you guys are talking about, which is the economic, like what, you know, what's the, what's the, the, the business imperative behind diversifying a workforce and especially in entertainment, you look at the, the TV networks and some of the movie studios and they're so archaic, but they're archaic by design, right? Because the, the type of TV show or the model for a TV show that made money in 1950 was then the model for 1955, which was then the model for 1960. And it, it keeps you know, you keep making shows that you think work. Nielsen ratings up until very recently were only asking black and white families of a certain type what kind of shows they watched. So then enter the, you know, uh, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflixes of the universe where it's subscription driven, it's not ad driven, the revenue stream is totally different. And they're taking what what at that time mainstream Hollywood would have considered a uh, perceived business risk. And they're just like, no, these ideas are great. Of course, the, the talent pool is there with writers and actors. And so let's just make this stuff. And that's why I, I think one of the reasons they have some of the best content out there right now is because they took those risks. Now you're seeing the, the big three mainstream from back in the day where we used to all watch our TV really struggle for, for a market share compared to the streamers. I think you're right. From a creative standpoint, you see, content that is more diverse than ever before, more interesting, able to uh, I feel like speak to the people who are actually watching the content. So in many ways, we are in this creative boom because uh, the industry, an archaic industry has been allowed to change or perhaps even forced to change. When you see the success is there, and then think back on getting to see how our, our national government works from the inside. Do you, do you long for the ability for a government that might be as flexible as our entertainment industry? That's funny. I've always thought of the entertainment industry as being very, very slow for things like that, right? And it was the, it was the innovation. It was the 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 streamers that were everybody thought was crazy at first. Like, really, we're going to mail DVDs to a place called Netflix <laughs> instead of just watching what's on or going to Blockbuster. So I, I wonder. I mean, the thing that worries me about that in the in government, I remember. So one of one of the things that I worked on very briefly. Uh, was uh, STEM and science outreach when I was President Obama's youth uh, liaison. And the the thing that that I always thought was wild was, you know, uh, folks on the left and right will debate things like whether science is real or how much money we should be spending on uh, public investment in science. And you can do that till you're blue in the face. But, you know, China, India, Brazil, these are all countries that are investing public money in innovation and in science and technology. And so, over the next 20 years, they're just going to beat us if we're not investing at the same level or above. And they're already starting to do that because we haven't come to a legitimate consensus on how much money we're investing in science. So it's that kind of stuff where I'm like, we just keep the, the political cycles because they're two years and four years. Th there's just such an echo chamber around that. And meanwhile, all of these countries that we compete with are are beating us. That That's what scares me when you make that comparison to government, right? Because the stakes are so much higher and they're for they're they're 50 years down the line, what's America gonna look like? Yeah, Governor, do you feel though, do you do you share those anxieties? Well, I mean, we talk a lot about the speed of government here, and I think I have a a, a frustration with it, and you are often yeah. telling me to pump the brakes, but yeah. do you see do you share some of those frustrations or well, see yeah, practical yeah, yeah. things that could could keep yeah. keep things intact but move them along quicker? So, you know, the problem gets to be now, I'll tell you one thing that we did when we took our majority uh, back, you know, before you were born, uh, Jordan, we we did dramatically fund the National Institutes of Health. And that is such an important part. That's a crown jewel of uh, of what we can do in government. I like what Cal said about STEM. And frankly, anybody who's, you know, like sober minded knows that we have to fund STEM. And as you know, they're just passing, I think they're going to pass some bill that's going to allow us to focus on, on the computer chip side of things, which is really broader than that, because we are falling behind and we have to get it done. The other issue is public health. And I may actually, I hope at the end of the day, do a little work for the public health folks. The problem is, and I think you probably have found this, Cal, is that Politicians latch on to certain things. And so they worry about, you know, education, Social Security. They worry about Medicaid, Medicare, all that. But these other issues like public health or the National Institutes of Health or STEM or things like that, or mental health, for example, often gets left behind, Jordan, 
There's, and what you have to do to advance them is find somebody who's such a strong advocate that they say, it'll be over my dead body that you'll get my vote on something else if you don't do this. And we don't have a lot of strong people to do that. So when it comes to STEM, we ought to be screaming and shouting from the rooftops. But Cal, I think you also agree. We also need to hear from outsiders who say, I'm not going to support you if you're not going to support a program like STEM and the advancement of science, basic research. I mean, it's critical, but it gets left behind, Jordan, a lot of times because it doesn't get the headlines. It doesn't get headlines. Cal, you, you know that, right? You see what gets headlines and you see what doesn't. The key is that the best legislators are the ones that don't worry about headlines. Yeah. Look, when I was uh, the, the two years that I was President Obama's youth liaison, one of the one of my biggest frustrations was how to work with outside advocates in the most effective way. And in, in my case, it was more on things like environment and immigration. I was there from 2009 to 2011. So uh, really before the wave of vitriol that kind of followed in the second term and then the Trump administration. But um, but I remember like I remember there were there was a meeting that I had uh, 120 the president had asked us to host an, a youth environmental summit. So basically we had 120 slots at the White House. And he said, fill it with young people who care about the environment. This was way back where we still thought that we could get something done legislatively on climate. And uh, and so we... Uh, oh, we those had, old days. Oh, yeah, boy. Know, that was well, there, were, there were horses in the streets, right? I remember. I've seen yeah, black and white pictures you know, this, of those times. Where, where you thought, I will say, where you, you had, you had a, a few more rational actors... So you could have these conversations. But I remember what we decided to do in, in terms of the makeup of, of those 120 people. A third of them came from the left-leaning environmental groups that you would think of when you think of the environmental movement. Then a third, roughly a third, were from the young evangelical community because they don't share the same views on climate change. But their, their whole uh, reason to get to the table is God put us here to take care of his planet. And we're like, fine. If you're going right. to you're going to help with pushing legislation, you should be there. And then the remaining third were uh, young people who were interested in the business around climate. So some of them were innovators who had just created these devices that will charge your iPhone uh, with the kinetic energy that you kind of create and carry around with you. And so they have all these crazy devices. They could care less about the politics of it. They just wanted to figure out how to sell stuff to people. And so it was a it was a fascinating meeting. But I, I do remember there was a one of the one of those left leaning groups I'd invited the executive director and her, her deputy director to the meeting. And as people were coming through the gate, there were about 50 people from that organization, really incredible, energetic young people wearing the t-shirts of this climate organization, holding up signs saying things like Obama doesn't care about climate, shame on Obama, like all of this stuff. And like, you know, fine, if that's what you want to do. But I kind of thought like I pulled them aside and I said, look, you, you both know my role here is not to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. But I just have to ask you why you have these amazing 50 energetic young people outside protesting this meeting. They're like, well, we just wanted to make sure our voice is being heard. I'm like, you're invited into the White House. Of course, your voice is being heard. Come on. Now, because of something called the Hatch Act, I was not able to tell them what I really wanted to tell them, which was, here's a list of Democratic members on the Hill who don't believe that we should push hard enough on climate. Forget the Republicans. They're probably never going to meet you halfway. But the, here are the Democrats whose support we need when we have a majority. Take those 50 people across town and do it there. But I couldn't do that because you're not allowed to because it's illegal, right? So uh, so it was very frustrating. Well, you could have done that, Cal. Well, I remember, I, I don't know if you've- But then you should have had them take free shirts up to the Hill. <laughs> Politicians yeah, exactly. love free swag. They I, love, I, don't ever forget that. I, I think it was uh, the, the, the book Angler about uh, Dick Cheney. I think there was a, there was a section in there where uh, Cheney got around the Hatch Act by saying, saying something like, um, you know, I'm not allowed to tell you to go lobby these five members of Congress. I got you. Uh, so, I won't, so we didn't even do that. You. But the, the point is that the role of advocates, I mean, it, it, they're, they're, the passion was so pure, but that, that map, which changes constantly, especially if you're talking about a group that's not like an AARP, right? AARP is well-funded. Everyone's going to be a senior citizen. You're only young for a certain amount of time, so you age out of the demographic. There are all of those people who have, who have such incredible energy. There's no singular roadmap because it changes changes so much on how to achieve those goals. So Governor, what you're saying about, you know, how to actually rally and say, if you don't do anything on this issue, that's it. It's that merger between single issue voters, between how to advocate properly and effectively for things that we all care about. Do, do you see um, 
do you see a delineation between young advocates and getting to engage with them? But like the the difference between Ivy League uh, folks who are coming at it from a different perspective than uh, uh, folks who aren't coming from that perspective. Oh. What, what what have you noticed, dude? Th- without a doubt, this was a whole thing on both Obama campaigns and when I was in government. I if I had a choice, I would never hire the Ivy League kid. They all they want to do is, and by the way, I mean no offense to all of the Ivy League listeners here. Well, you just defended I, them all, you know, Cal, right I've there. That's okay. But listen, but they, all, they all know I'm right. Take about a stand. This. Take they, a stand. What they want to do, if let's say I'm hiring a young organizer on a campaign, and I have two qualified candidates, one's Ivy, one's a state school uh, kid, or hasn't even gone to college. The two who have not gone to college or went to a state school are going to work their asses off. The one who went to an Ivy League school is going to write me a long email about what I should be doing differently. And like, that's fine. We can have that combo over a beer after work one night. That's all good. But like your job is to get your hands dirty and make shit happen. Come on. So it was very frustrating. A lot of times the, the you know, the uh, the non-Ivy, uh, particularly I'm, I'm talking, you know, exclusively about just young advocates. They were so ready to throw down and, and do whatever work was required. And it was a little bit like pulling teeth with the uh, the others. <laughs> we'll be right back. And now back to the show. Hey, Cal, I want to switch just for a second. Uh, You know, it was interesting to hear about the struggles that you had being a brown face in Hollywood, okay? Now, when I think about Hollywood, I think about super liberal, like everybody loves everybody, you know, ban the bomb and, you know, whatever, all the liberal things that you can think of, (laughs) right? That's That's how it's advertised. But yet you're there in Hollywood, and even recently, uh, and probably still exists, that as a brown face, you were discriminated against. I mean, that's like talking out of both sides of your mouth. What what are we supposed to believe about Hollywood? And I must have been, really must have just, just pissed you off, frankly, and got you so aggravated. Am I right? You're 100% right. Look, I, I, I think there uh, things are things are complicated, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think Hollywood oftentimes we get a free pass um, when it comes to diversity, when it comes to misogyny. They're, thankfully, the last five years, especially, there's been so much necessary conversation uh, around both of those two issues. But I think you're right. I mean, I remember going to auditions. I, I write about. It's funny in the in the in the book in the audiobook, the first draft I had like 50 stories in there about just racist casting experiences and how that made me feel. And then I turned it in and my, my editor was like, this is too many. This is too many racist stories. This is now a, I'm like, well, does it sound like I have a chip on my shoulder? And she's like, well, no, cause they're all really entertaining. You tell them with humor, but uh, it's just too many. I mean, it's so, so to your point, governor, I, I, I do remember just being, you know, being walked out of rooms after I was told I speak really good English or asking why I don't have a turban on my head. And I had a casting director once tell me to go home and put a tie a bedsheet around my head to resemble a turban for a are you, you can't be ser- You can't be serious. I, is, are you <laughs> good, serious? Good plug. Good plug for the title of the <laughs> yeah, book. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious. And I and I I remember that, you know, that it was always tough to articulate. Of course, other performers of color who I would chat with about this stuff, we all sort of rolled our eyes because you'd, you know, you'd you'd pull into the parking lot. And it was like all John Kerry bumper stickers and all these, you know, pat each other on the back kind of liberalism. But when it came down to it, you know, they 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 were sort of not walking the walk. Um, I, I remember even when uh this is not about casting, but when uh when I was early in the Obama campaign, this must have been the, the end of 07 into 08 before the Iowa caucuses. There was a producer, well-known producer, uh, who uh, is an acquaintance who called me and said, hey, uh, I know you started working for Obama. Um, we were thinking of writing him a check, you know, because we wrote we wrote checks to Hillary and Edwards um, and we like his speeches. But if he wins, do you think he's just going to nominate all black people to his cabinet? And I I laughed and I was like, I mean, I hope so. Right. <laughs> and the guy, the guy goes, no, seriously, Cal, we're really worried that he might do that. I'm like, what? The, the, the Obama campaign in 07 was the first place that I had worked um, that didn't feel like there was tokenization. There was real representation among the ranks. People were being hired because of their merits. You know, the, I remember the guy who was working on LGBT outreach and uh, military outreach happened to be a straight Marine. Uh, the guy who was doing rural outreach in Iowa was a guy named Rohan Patel, who's uh, uh, Indian American. And so it, it just kind of flew in the face of what your, your rational 
uh, thing would tell you is like, hey, don't send the brown guy to do rural outreach in the 98% white state. Well, why not if he's the most qualified, you know? Um, so I started saying all of these sorts of things and this very liberal, very, I guess, well-meaning, very scared Hollywood producer sort of came around eventually. But it's those types of things that I, I don't think we get to talk about enough where that nuance, you know, I, I almost hesitate calling it a hypocrisy because I think we, we all have our own hypocrisies yeah. about things well, like this. we all are hypocrites. You're yeah, right. yeah, in some way. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because it's one of the narratives in the book is how systems can and do change and some of the frustrating and ridiculous stories along the way. I, I'm. It was surprising to me as somebody who's had almost almost no success with the entertainment industry, but for a sustained period of time, you see hypocrisy and BS there. Uh, but it's still shocking to me within the relatively near future that you're showing up to auditions where there are white actors wearing brown face yeah. and like the anecdote you have about Sabrina, teenage witch. I think like you brought out something that I thought was, again, still shocking to me, no, knowing that there's BS within there. It's still amazing on a day to day. What kind of um, things you were confronted with, but you talked about, you call it the Brown catch 22, which, which I think is fascinating in that I'll let you explain it, but, but I guess I'm curious about, this idea of uh, when to engage with the people who hold the power to give you a voice within that world. And also, right. as we know, the the entertainment industry is a tough industry. It's not necessarily a meritocracy. It's got right. so much BS on it. And you are, you are praying to get a foot in any door and then to actually try to get that foot in that door, but also confront the inherent problems that are helping you not get that foot in the door. Like, yeah. how did you... How did you not go crazy in having to constantly engage with that question? I think, well, I mean, first of all, if you're an actor, you're already crazy, right? So I think that's part of it. You're just like, well, I'm already insane. Uh, but you're right. Look, the, the brown face thing was was quite common and still happens. I think the, the last case of it that was well publicized was Aladdin a couple of years ago, the live action Aladdin, uh, where a lot of their background artists were, were painted. Uh, and we can do better than that, obviously, especially today. But uh, but the, the Sabrina story is an interesting one. By the way, I should say, when it came to brownface, what was interesting was, you know this, Jordan, that like the when you want to be an actor badly enough, you'll do whatever it takes within the confines of what you're allowed to do. So my beef almost was not with those individual actors themselves, but I was like fascinated. I'm like, did you paint your face at home? Did you do it in the car? If you did it before you left your house, was there a higher likelihood you were going to get pulled over? Did you did you go to the bathroom at the casting office and do it? Did your agent tell you? Like how I have so many questions. You like, know the agent. You know the agent said it. There was definitely an agent <laughs> yeah. and a manager. I mean, that it started there. <laughs> right, right. But the the Sabrina story was really eye-opening for me. That, you know, that was a show that I remember my little cousins used to watch. And uh it was a really short audition audition for the part of a kid in Sabrina's study group. Um, and, you know, it was a kid's show and really light and, and fun. And I, I went in and uh, I, I, I gave the audition and I, on the way back to my car, the casting director is running after me and he goes, Hey man, they want you to do it again. They thought you were so great. I'm like, Oh man, instant callback. This is awesome. So I walk back into the room with him. And as, as I'm about to walk in the room, he goes, uh, by the way, they want you to do it again uh, with an accent. And, uh, and this, this was not uncommon by any means. So I walk back in, the producers are all like, hey, you did such a great job. We'd like you to do it again with an accent. And I said the thing I usually said at the time, which was, that's great. What kind of accent would you like? I can do New York, Italian, Scottish, Irish, uh, Southern. And they, you know, they would sort of lean in and go, why don't we just stick to Indian? I'm like, yeah, no, right, of course. And then the thing that kind of goes into your mind in those days is, you know, this is a choice that I have. I'm not, I'm certainly not now, especially... Uh, whining uh, about some things like I had the I could have walked out of there, of course. But I think the, the two things that went into my head were this is a credit on your resume if you get it. And it's really hard for you to get your foot in the door because you're really only allowed to read for certain parts that are like this. So so do you want that credit on your resume? And then number two, the job paid probably 700 bucks and my rent was 550 a month. So this is basically a month where you're, you don't have to work your job at Starbucks or as a runner or a, or a production assistant. Um, you know, so, so I decided to, to do it and I went home and I called my agent and, uh, and I said, if I get this part, um, I'm wondering if you can talk to them and see if I can just do it without an Indian accent. Uh, and she said, well, they just called and said, you did get the part. My suggestion to you would be, you know, you're going to do it anyway, because you need the credit. So why don't you go in and talk, go in a little early that they talk to the director, see if you can just explain the situation to them. So I went in there, found the director at the coffee cart. I was like, hey, man, thank you so much for this opportunity. Your show is so funny. Whatever question of all, it's about a talking cat. 
uh, and, and I said, uh, I said, you know, I was I was really hoping that I could do this the way I gave my first audition because I created this whole backstory. This character is like wearing flannels. He's from he's from the Pacific Northwest and like small batch organic coffee. And he looks at me. He's like, no, no, no. We hired you to do that accent. So that's what you're going to do. And I said, OK, well, they say that uh, racism comes from ignorance. So I don't want to just say that this dude is super racist. I'm just going to explain the situation. So I'm like, you know, I rarely get to audition for parts where I don't, you know, uh, do an accent. I just thought it'd be really cool. I never grew up watching characters that didn't have accents who looked like me. So I thought it might be a neat opportunity for everybody. He goes, uh, no, you're doing the accent. And I was like, well, maybe I'm not properly making my case. Right. So I said, look, my little cousins watch this show. And I never got to see anybody who looked like me who wasn't a stereotype. Your writing is so funny. I just thought it would be so cool if my little cousins could see a character who looks like them on screen. Uh, and he goes, uh, well, let me tell you something. Um, your cousins should be lucky that a guy like you is allowed on TV to begin with. And so should you. Uh, you're doing the accent. And he walks off. And the thing that the thing that I realized at that moment, aside from like, fuck this guy, was... Um, you know, it's not uh, it's not just ignorance. It's a it's a very well understood calculus based on that guy understood everything I was saying. He's like, I understand why this is super racist. I still think it's funny, and I don't necessarily care what you think. To your point about it not being a meritocracy, right? He held the power again. Could I have left? Well, there, there would have been consequences, obviously, if I'd left. But I had the power to do that, and I chose not to. I chose to kind of put my head down and get the credit on my resume. Now I'm able to talk about it, and thankfully, now Hollywood has obviously changed a lot in the 15 years since that story happened. But those are the kinds of stories that happened a lot that still happen to some extent, uh, obviously in different ways. But the reason that I talk about them so openly in the book is obviously not to like slam the Sabrina the Teenage Witch producer, but really to like to say. This is what's amazing, going back to what I said earlier about, about the streaming platforms. This is what's so incredible about what I love about what we do as storytellers, right? Is that you can elevate the comedy, you can elevate the stories and the storytelling and make it more inclusive. And when you do that, audiences are better off no matter what the demographic of the audience is. And, and Hollywood has obviously been doing that. It's a little slow, but we've been doing that. And that's to me really exciting. That's to me the, the reason to talk about the, the, that sort of an arc and journey. Well, Cal, you played... Um... You also played a, a ter attempted terrorist, or I guess a terrorist. <laughs> no, on, he was the on, terrorist on Twenty Four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because of of how you looked, really. Yeah. I mean, when if you would go, well, of course you can't go back. I guess we all have to get to that point. It's sort of like we get to a fork in the road, and we've got to decide what really matters, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, on number one is maybe. You shouldn't have done that thing. Have you ever? I bet you thought about it over the years. But what about like on twenty four? You know, where all of a sudden the country goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, he looks like a terrorist." You know, <laughs> right? I mean, that's it's it's really it's it's a it's a serious thing. Then we hear about immigration, and people are like, "Oh no, we can't have those people there." And I wonder how much of that is connected to stuff that people see on television because it's BS, right? To to try to color an entire nation of people based on something you saw in 24, you know, or some other movie, right? Yeah. Representation is always, I, I, I agree with you. I think rep representation obviously matters a great deal. And, and uh, unfortunately, we often think of tokenization as the same thing as representation and they're not, you know, tokenization is like, I feel really good because I put one black woman in my whole movie and she had five lines. Um, you know, as opposed to real representation and, and storytelling. The, the 24 example is an interesting one because that was that was actually before. So the character I played um, was an American uh, homegrown radicalized uh, terrorist, a kid in the suburbs. And that was before we had that challenge in America. So we based, or at least I based that character on what was happening in the UK at the time. Uh, and the UK had had cases like that. Um, in real life, I'm terrified of guns. I'm terrified of terrorists. And I was playing a young terrorist who held a family hostage with a handgun. So taking the race out of it, the actor part of me was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> because it's so uncomfortable for me to do this. Right. Um, but I think you're right. You know, the, you you can't apply a 2022 standard to that. But of course, I'm I'm mindful of of imagery. I think that a lot of the challenges come from that confusion between tokenization and representation. This this happens a lot when we talk about even something as silly as a cartoon character, right? There there um, there are people who feel very strongly about uh, um, the Simpsons and Apu, and I I write about this in the in the, a little tiny section of my book where I'm like, you know, the tricky thing there is the 
the yellow characters are all presumed to be white and the brown characters all have uh, racial signifiers, right? Apu's got a, a, a stereotypical accent. He's voiced by a white guy. Um, and so the issue there is not that, sure, the, the idea that The Simpsons makes fun of everybody, of course it does. But there aren't an equal amount of brown characters to make fun of for independent traits other than their ethnicity, religion, and race. So that's kind of the conflict in a lot of these situations where if you if you had an equal playing field, and you know, my, my friend John Cho talks about this a lot. It's like, you know, when I'm offered the part of the nice Asian cop, I don't want to play the nice Asian cop. I want to play somebody who's flawed. I want to play a character who has who has real life issues and challenges and who makes mistakes. And part of the the nuance of, of stereotyping is you want all of those flaws and nuances to to, to come out there. That's really what makes people human. And and again, it's you know, I, I don't have any regrets of the characters I've played. Would I have preferred one of my first movies? I'm like parachuting out of a helicopter and saving countries. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not Chris Evans. So, you know. Uh, I, I, you take what you get. The, this is a just a, in, in my opinion. I I'm thinking Bond. Well, I am I now beginning to, to think. Bond. I am thinking. Bond. Could you imagine Bond. if you were doing Bond and then all of a sudden you said, Jordan, I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> what? Come on, Cal. Why don't you go? We'll we'll start a campaign on this podcast. I'll do Bond. Cal <laughs> Cal Penn for Bond. What I'm do you think? Down. I'm super down. I would I would do it. I mean, it's kind of a misogynistic character. I don't know if you want to be regressive. I mean, the first Indian Bond, yikes, who's misogynistic. Way to go, Cal. A terrorist and now a misogynist. Wait. You're you're you represent an entire culture, sir. Can, Shame on you. Can I play, can I say you you reminded me of something that that's both what you just said and what the governor asked, which is uh the looking back, right? Looking back on your career. We get this question a lot. There were, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Todd Phillips or somebody who who was uh uh lamenting um, that because there's so much, I'm totally paraphrasing, by the way, so please forgive the name drop. I don't know if it's accurate. But the uh, the idea that uh, people lament that, oh, you can't make certain jokes anymore because people get offended and blah, blah, blah. I mean, look, Harold and Camargo to White Castle was obviously a misogynistic film. It was also the first time that you had two Asian American men in the lead in a buddy comedy. But when I think about, I hope we get to do a fourth movie. If we got to do a fourth movie in 2022 or 2023, uh, what an amazing opportunity to make it funnier than that first movie because comedy has evolved, right? So I don't feel like we're ever limited by the changing nature of the audience. Um, and number two, there are, there are so many younger Asian American and South Asian performers who are in their 20s now who sometimes I'll, you know, I'll have a conversation with them and they go, hey man, don't you regret you know, playing a character named Taj Mahal in Ryan Reynolds' early movie, Van Wilder? I'm like, no, why? Because don't you think that set us back? I was like, buddy, you're welcome. You're welcome because somebody had to do it, you know, not to be not to be cocky about it. But the point is, there are always these growing pains and rites of passage that that happen to get from point A to point B. Now we're having a bond conversation. Now we're looking at Marvel movies that are diverse. That's awesome. I want to be in all of that. But you can't go back and go, yeah, I regret this because the reality was that was the only job you were going to get. So and of course, no disrespect to the actors who turned down those parts. I turned down certainly many of those uh, uh, on my own. But um, it's complicated is my point. And it's a, it's wonderfully complicated now that there's more diversity than there used to be. You, you are ta you're like, I'm Taj Mahal, so you could be Brad. You're welcome. <laughs> exactly. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. It's interesting, you know, we talk about it, and, and the governor brought this up earlier, this, this, this uh, idea of Hollywood being liberal. And obviously there's a lot of, a lot of, complicated liberal people in high positions in Hollywood, uh, tending to to make stories that people would say perhaps are progressive stories. Again, I think there's lots of discussion within this, but I uh, I was at CPAC recently and uh, a, a very prevalent theme in a lot of speeches was we've lost our institutions. Uh, the, the cultural institutions are owned by the left and only by the left. Our stories are getting silenced. Um, like we're obviously talking about all the reckonings that a lot of these, there are a lot of small reckonings happening. There's some larger reckonings. I think what you were just referencing to, I think was also around the conversation around the Joker where it was like, what, what is this story that we're telling? Are we elevating yeah. this? Is this, is this the right type of story to elevate? Um, but there's a, a big segment of the population who views Hollywood in general as too liberal. Do you, do you empathize with that? Do you see credence in some of those, those feelings about the types of stories that you're seeing being told? 
my experience is not really, you know, um, that's obviously just one person's experience, but I, I remember just uh, feeling like, you know, you, Twitter is a great example. I mean, you know this from the work that you do, Jordan, you, you, you look at any, so many prominent writers, producers, network executives who tweet in support of stopping Asian hate, for example. And then you look at their IMDb list and there are zero Asian Americans in any of their writers' rooms or their casts. Now, I'm not so cynical to say that you don't actually care about this issue, but I am, my eyes are open enough to say, wouldn't the better solution be that you're part of making sure that the stories we tell, uh, Governor, your point about representation and making sure that everyone knows that these are you know, these are American voices. Like that's that's perhaps the better thing to do, rather than than tweet in rage. Um, but I also think that you know, yeah, look, the the institutions. I did not go to, to CPAC, uh, but I would imagine the institutions they're referring to are institutions that are uh, that are are a lot more diverse in the last decade and a half. And so I would imagine that a lot of the people that you talk to did feel and did have evidence that what they view as their institutions historically, which are institutions that only uh, white folks of a certain income bracket and certain zip codes perhaps could could access, um, is now being opened up to more people who maybe don't look like them. That That's not rocket science. That's a good thing that's happening. It's making things more equitable. Um, but the backlash, I think, probably comes from that a little bit. There's one other thing here that struck me, Cal, about you. And, uh, and I know that Jordan feels the same way because we've all been influenced by our parents so much. This whole thing about your parents are like, you want to be a what? Right? Tell us a little bit about what was the fear that your parents had or the concern? Because my parents didn't like the fact that I told them I was, thought I was going to go into politics. So yeah. they're like, what? That's horrible. All the people we know in politics, <laughs> they're all corrupt. You right. can't do that. You know? So what, what did your parents say to you? I, look, my, my parents are both immigrants. Uh, they they moved here. Um, my my dad uh, has a graduate degree in engineering. My mom has one in chemistry, and so they were allowed to come to the United States because of the post nineteen sixty five uh, immigration changes and and the fact that we had a shortage of engineers and scientists in the United States. That's the only reason that they and their friends were able to come. They had the right degree and we had a labor shortage. And so, which is not to say they didn't, you know, work their asses off. My dad tells a story about how he, he had the equivalent of $12 in his pocket and slept on the floor of a distant cousin's apartment while he sort of got set up the first few weeks. Um, but so then, you know, my brother and I, born and raised in in New Jersey, were raised fully American kids, bilingual, you know, the whole, the whole thing. And I realized I have a passion for the arts and I'm like, Hey, I, you know, we, in high school, I remember this so vividly, uh, you know, you go around the room, your parents have their friends over and their friends, kids, and everyone's talking about what they want to do in college or after high school. And it's the same. It's literally like, like five people in a row. I want to go to med school. I, I applied to Yale early, you know, uh, and then it gets to me and I'm like, I kind of want to be an actor and a filmmaker. And there's like the record scratch and the room goes silent and people are consoling my mother. I'm so sorry for your loss, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't, as a kid, you don't realize, right. As, as a kid, there's no nuance. There's like, what's wrong with me or what's wrong Honey, with he'll them? be okay. Right. He'll, yeah, he'll, exactly. he'll come he'll to his fine. senses. He'll come right. to his senses. Yeah. And that's true. They, my, my parents were actually not like this, but they're, they're friends. I remember. So, so, uh, family friends would say to the older kids who were already in med school, hey, go talk to him. Go talk some sense into him. Let him know that that he shouldn't pursue this, you know, so this acting thing. And it wasn't, it, it honestly wasn't until I was researching uh, this book. There's a lot of fact checking because any of the race stuff, any of the politics stuff, the Hollywood stuff, I, I wanted to make sure that especially if I was naming specific projects that I fact checked things and I wasn't just, you know, writing stuff that I remembered uh, without corroboration. And part of that was my parents' story. So I, I checked in with them so much. Uh, and at the end, I said, you know, there was this one thing that I wanted to put on a scale of one to 10 you know, how embarrassed were you guys when I said I wanted to be an actor in those rooms full of your friends and their kids? And so I called my parents and they go, they go, embarrassed. What are you talking about? I'm like, you know, I remember those days and I've written about them. I just want to know how embarrassed were you? Like, what does my 15 year old brain remember? You know, and they go, we were never embarrassed. We were scared because we just didn't think that the arts were a legitimate career that somebody could have in America, especially somebody who looked like us. And I was floored. I mean, I am 43 years old having this conversation with my parents, never once considering that it was fear that was driving 
any of those 15 year old conversations. So I have a, obviously have a lot of respect for them and their uh, and their friends in their immigration story. But man, they definitely their version of the American dream was definitely not their firstborn son uh, smoking fake weed and sliding off of a naked woman in a teen comedy. That's for sure. Yeah. Or playing or playing a tin man. Yeah. Right. Playing a tin man or a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> they got to see many different versions of you. That's what, did, what, what a beautiful yes. thing. They birthed the child of many faces. Uh, yes. What a gorgeous thing. I, I find it truly remarkable. Like the fact that you've, you've found success in an industry to get a foothold in that industry. So many people in the world of entertainment, you struggle to get that foothold and you do anything to, to never let go. The fact that you did and you took a sabbatical for public service is insane. I mean, it's 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 a really insane type of thing. I, I don't ever see myself serving. I tell myself that telling jokes is serving my country, but that's as close as a veteran I'll, I'll probably ever become. But the fact that you made that choice to leave a foothold and go into into a place where you could make a difference, I find very impressive. And I, I, I wonder, out of some of the things that you learned there and seeing what it's like to take your successes in the entertainment industry and then go into a place that has its own rules, uh, but clearly has a place for people who are charismatic, understand how to communicate and how to get a message across and craft a story. Like what we're starting to see on the, like clearly celebrity is becoming more and more of an element in elections. Uh, Al Franken had a certain amount of success uh, based on his ability to navigate uh, tough conversations through humor and celebrity. And, and you, you hear, here every so often the conversations come up on the left about like a John Stewart or somebody jumping into the ring. And I think those are indulged more on the right now because we've seen it happen with a, a steak salesman. But do you see having been inside uh, the Obama White House, do you see space for that in the future? And could that be something other than, uh, oh, it's silly that a, another entertainer has run for office. It's, uh, Ronald Reagan was an anomaly. But do you think there's actually a sweet spot where perhaps an articulate uh, entertainer from the, the left would find a place in the White House or a position of power? Yeah, possibly. I think sometimes we, we put too much focus on that. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And by the way, you're I mean, don't sell your satire short, Jordan. There are uh, uh, tons of people I know who whose eyes are opened because of that type of storytelling and comedy. So uh, it's there's such a key. It's true. They're just, it, you know, it's incredible. I'm, um, I'm going to print that out and put it onto a purple heart and then wear it. Uh, it's not stolen valor before you out me for stolen. Is that bad? Is that bad? Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, sorry, you were breaking up. I couldn't hear you. Uh, no, I look the, the thing that I, and I understand, I remember when I, um, I thought very naively, perhaps, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I'm really inspired by the year that I worked on the Obama campaign. There is an opportunity to go serve, uh, in the white house. That is a story that we don't have time for. I know, but I tell the longer version, which includes Michelle Obama hazing me into, into getting this job. Um, but I, I didn't think anything of it. And I thought, okay, well, I, I really, it, it's an honor to serve my country. And this is somebody who I believe in. And so if, if, uh, I'm qualified, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and then after it, I didn't anticipate it becoming a story. And I remember people calling going, wow, you know, do you realize you're the only person in the history of entertainment who's like ever gone to work in politics? And like the governor of California is literally Arnold Schwarzenegger right now. Like it's, you know, and there's a long list on the left or right. Ben Stein, you know, worked for two presidents and, and of course, Reagan, like you mentioned. And so, I, but the bigger takeaway for me was going into government and, um, and realizing that, I would say the the majority, so well over 50, maybe 60% of the people who I was working with um, were not permanent public sector employees. So a lot of them had taken leaves of absence from law school or from being a, a CEO or an executive or a lawyer. Uh, we had a pediatrician who was working in our office who was taking a leave from her practice just to serve our country. And of course, I went from a, a TV show to working at the White House. So there was what I consider perhaps some more undue attention to my story. But my story literally was the story of thousands of other people who were serving in the federal government. And that that happens across the board. I obviously don't know enough about the former administration and who worked there and why. But I know that for it, it, it was... Uh, this is one of those unique things that people can do. You can do it locally. You don't have to take a full sabbatical from what you're doing. But that was truly inspiring to me. That I, and I, I think that we'll see more candidates who who merge the private public sector thing as as time goes on, just because there are opportunities there. You know, um, Cal, just and, and Jordan, just a, a little bit about Obama. This will get uh, some of some of the Republicans that listen to this thing probably rolling their eyes, but. Um, <laughs> 
you know, he, he invited me to the White House. It's really an amazing story to, to be part of a announcement on the Pacific Trade Agreement. He was for open and free trade, which Republicans used to always be for. Um, and I went, and they, they, I, I said I would go. And um, so they called, the White House called and said, well, you know, is it okay if the, if the governor sits next to the president? And I'm like, why are you asking that question? Well, because a lot of Republicans don't want to come down here and be seen with, uh, with Obama. And I'm like, well, look, if he wants to share half of his chair, I'll be glad to sit on the other <laughs> half of his chair. Um, I had a chance to play golf with him and interact with him. And there's a number of things that I disagreed with him on. Uh, but, you know, look, I can't tell you how nice he was to my kids. Just wonderful to my, to my children. And, uh, and they, they loved the experience with him. He's a, he's a, sometimes a little too cool for his own good, as you know, Cal, but he's a, he's a cool guy. He's a guy's guy. He's a guy you have a beer with, you have some fun, you play golf with. Um, we've gotten to the point where we just, we can't even look for the good in some of these people if they happen to be in the other party. And it's just so stupid and it's just so wrong. And when you get to know these people, then you, you kind of look at them differently than if all you do is read the, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal editorial page. You know, uh, I take it that uh, I don't know Michelle Obama, never met her. But for him, the president, couldn't have been nicer to me, couldn't have been more respectful. And I take it that that's one of the things that you took away from, you know, from, from your ability to, uh, to work with him and be with him and fly on that great airplane, Air Force One. Jordan, because of his, his uh, routine, will never fly on Air Force One, but that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, but, but Sal, Cal, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think? Jordan might be able to make it on Air Force Two. No, oh, I know. That, I, mean, I, I wouldn't. I would. You want me to fly coach, <laughs> governmental coach? No way. You know, and I got. I, I. I wouldn't go on Air Force One because of the leg room issues. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I. I think you're right, Governor. I, look, I talk you know, about him, the man, because you got a chance to be up and close and see what he was all about, and tell people well, a little I'll bit about you, what I'll, he was I'll, like personally. I'll tell you one of the re one of the, the reason that I uh, that I first got involved in his campaign. This was October of 2007, and. Uh, I was working on the TV show House at the time. Olivia Wilde was uh, one of my co-stars, and she had a plus one to an Obama event. Now, October 07 is coming out of the summer before the Iowa caucuses when Obama was down 30 points in the polls against Hillary Clinton and John Edwards. And so this event that she was she had the plus one to that she invited me to was designed as a, a recruiting event for artists in the entertainment industry to go to the first two or three primary states. So, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina to help Obama campaign. And so I said, I had no interest in, a, in an event like that. Uh, and Olivia was like, oh, it's an open bar. And I was like, sweet, I'm in. So before going to this event, I remember looking at uh, Obama's campaign website and I was reading this section on, on climate change because I thought, you know, it's a room full of 50 artists. They're all gonna ask questions about things like arts funding and arts education. I want to ask a question that's totally outside of that. So I'll ask a climate change question. And when I was reading about uh, on his uh, his platform, there was a there was a section on ethanol um, and how to fund you know corn ethanol production. And I had remembered an article I read in Foreign Affairs because I'm a gigantic nerd who subscribes to Foreign Affairs. Uh, there was an article, I, I guess, a couple of months prior in Foreign Affairs that talked about how if you uh, if you invest too heavily in corn to turn into ethanol, then the price of corn goes up for people in developing countries and they can't feed themselves. So uh, so I was like, aha, this is my smart, smarty pants question in a room full of actors for Obama. So I go with Olivia. We have like three glasses of wine. Obama's making the rounds. He says hello to both of us. And I said, uh, you know, Senator, I, I was reading your campaign website. Got a question for you. You know, you're investing pretty heavily in ethanol. Uh, isn't that just going to drive the price of corn up for people who rely on it for food? And Obama looks at me and goes, oh, yeah, I read that article in Foreign Affairs, too. And uh, if you read my website carefully, you would have seen that I'm investing in corn based ethanol as a bridge to cellulosic ethanol so that we can create fuel from things like our grass clippings and raking the leaves. And he gives me like, you know, a sort of cocky smirk and walks on to the next person. He's and good at the cocky he's smirk. So he's the and best at cocky smirk. Olivia was like, you just got schooled by Barack Obama. And I was like, 
In fairness, I don't know where the hubris and arrogance of being an actor made me think that perhaps one article I read made me know more <laughs> than somebody who sits on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and is running for president of the United States. But Olivia and I signed up to volunteer that day. And that's so to your point, Governor, yes, there <laughs> was a good story. There's a there's a way of he is obviously incredibly smart, but he has a way of talking to people that will take the you know, take the nonsense out of the room and kind of be able to focus on on, on commonality. This is obviously, you know, the story is a the ridiculous one, but but ha- having the chance to work for him time and time again, you know, you, you saw that and that, that idea that there is obviously no magic wand uh, when it comes to consensus. And we can't expect a miracle if we're not talking to each other and realizing that we still do have things in common. And I worry very much that, you know, we're we're losing sight of that if we haven't already. You've... You've written this memoir, and I I can only imagine what it takes to to write a memoir. It feels like it's so much self reflection. Uh, it sounds nauseating to me to actually look yeah. at myself in the mirror day in and day out, craft a story of my life. It feels absolutely terrifying. Was it cathartic for you? How do you write the ending to your own story? Oh. Or that has that has to be a, a psychological warfare with yourself. The the uh, the way I would describe it is so. This took me about three and a half years to write. Uh, and I have not experienced the type of self-loathing that I experienced in those three and a half years since like middle school. Like it was wild because I'm recounting, you know, I recount stories that my good friends know very well and that I tell to buddies over beers and, but recounting them sober by yourself on your computer, it like brings out this other thing of like, oh, I still have issues dealing with this thing that I thought was funny because as you know, obviously so much comedy comes from like, shit that's happened to us that we haven't fully worked, uh, worked through. Right. So, uh, so the first, I would say the first year was that. And then uh, as the stories kind of got more streamlined and as I was able to add the humor back in and, and then send it to friends who were like, Oh yeah, I remember this story. And I, I, I am really proud of the book. The big takeaway from it that I was very pleasantly surprised with, unlike a TV show or a, or a movie, uh, people who listen to audiobooks and read books are very kind on Twitter. Like so if you're doing a TV show, somebody will watch all 24 episodes of a season. And then on the 24th, we'll tweet at you. I was a huge fan until halfway through that last episode. That episode sucks. You should kill yourself. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? That's a little aggressive. But book readers and audiobook listeners, very kind. They listen to the whole thing like, I wish this section was longer, but I thought that was very funny. I'm gifting this to my friend. I'm like, how kind. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I found I work in a medium that tends to get boiled down to TikTok videos that are about 30 seconds long. And yeah. it seems as if you they, other people could not see you as a human if they only engage with you at 30 second uh, intervals. So that, no, that, that's right. That must be nice to, to be it, able to be in someone's ears for days at a time. It, it's literally I mean, the, the, I wrote the book in a way that I wanted to feel like I was having a beer with the person listening or, or, or reading it. Um, and like I said, since one of the subtexts is literally how systems change you can't you can't do i tried doing like short instagram videos about what the book's about but i'm like this doesn't resonate unless you actually have the time to listen to the various stories that make up that narrative so you're right <laughs> well cal i want to just say i you're just a you're such a good guy i so enjoyed this and and i can tell you that all the corn farmers across the midwest so appreciate that question. You think that that question you had to Barack Obama was just was this 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 is seminal. I'll bet your book's going to go so hot now because these farmers are going to show their their appreciation for you. So I don't ever say, think it didn't matter. It I, did. Thank you. I stopped short of uh, delving into how part of the investing in corn was probably just to win Iowa. I, I decided not to go there, but but yes, you're right. <laughs> Maybe a, a follow-up that's just strictly ethanol-based stories might be a good lane for you, Cal. Right, just- yeah. <laughs> cellulose. Go cellulose. There, there, I'll, I'll leave you with one other. Uh, if you liked the corn-based ethanol story, uh, and Jordan, I think you especially will appreciate this. The The question that I often get like from other actor friends of mine is like, did you ever put your foot in your mouth 
at the White House? And the answer is constantly, by the way. Um, but because I tried to compartmentalize those things, I remember it was probably my like second week. Uh, as you mentioned, one of my jobs was outreach to the Asian American community. And so sometimes I would get looped into um, things that were relevant, that were the crossover between Asian Americans and, and visiting dignitaries from other countries. So I remember getting added to this like 80 person email chain from the National Security Council. And they said, Cal, as the Asian American outreach person, you should know uh, the following talking points because the president is receiving a delegation from the Philippines. Now, in government, everything in your email is uh, spelled out in bold, and then it's an acronym in parentheses. So this email said, uh, we need you to know about the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And then in parentheses, it just said MILF. And then it said MILF is considered highly dangerous. MILF recruits young men. Many young men grow to regret their affiliation with MILF. And I'm at my desk, like, loving everything about this email. And without really thinking about it, I hit reply all and said, whoa, their main terror group are the MILFs? Amazing. And as soon as I hit send, I was like, no, what did you do? <laughs> and so then like 80 members of the National Security Council have a MILF joke from me on a permanent record on email. And nobody had my back. Like in the hallway, people would be like, yo, that was really funny. We were all thinking it. But on email, everyone was like silent. Um, and so I realized, you know what? Don't be... Uh, don't be TV's Cal Penn when you're uh, when you're working on national security emails. Just keep t- keep it to yourself. Tell, well, tell I, I, I tell you, Cal, I'd like to find that story amusing, but I think our <laughs> federal policy towards milfs has been just shameful for decades. And you had an opportunity to affect it, and you 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 blew it. So shame on you. You're right. That's my fault. That's my bad. It's it's up to the next person now. Well, you can find Cal Penn's very funny, very funny, very open, very entertaining memoir, You Can't Be Serious, available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Very highly recommended. Cal, thanks for talking to us. Thank you both. I'm a big, big fan of both of you, so thanks for having me. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Jordan here, uh, your favorite host of the Kasich Klepper podcast. Thank you for listening this far. If you like what you hear, Click like or thumbs up or whatever icon signifies a positive reaction. We love your ratings. We love your thoughts. Reach out to us on social media. Let us know what you want us to talk about because I'm tired of answering the governor's questions and I just prefer to answer yours. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kugler. Line producers, Oscar Guido. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort. With production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by Acast.